First up, Dr. John Paletti. Dr. Paletti was an instrumental in building the art history program at Wesleyan, where from 1972 to 2009, he taught the history of Italian Renaissance art and the art of the 20th century. His book, Michelangelo's David, illuminates the David in the context of the culture and the artistic history of Florence and its monuments. His talk will explore how the statue has become a cliche for high culture and how we might learn to see David without the veil. Dr. Paletti. No. Thank you. Do you want to hold it or do you want to put it? That's fine. First, I should thank Mary Elizabeth for inviting me to speak tonight and Bill Hall for his technical assistance here. Um, I want to talk about the David and to try to deep. Well, I just broke that. <laughs> I get an extra minute. For yes, that. you do. You get an extra minute for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the timer stopped. You're good. Okay. You're good. All right. So, how do we take something that we all think we know something about and learn something more about it? Uh, everybody has seen this statue some way, somehow, somewhere. Uh, and it has become a kind of cultural cliché. So what do we do? Uh, in fact, the Italians started our thinking about this in 1873. Let's see if I can move this forward. There we go. When the statue was taken inside, because it was starting to weather rather badly, when they took it inside, they also cleaned it with a bad solution of hydrochloric acid. So originally, it was much smoother, much glossier, much more highly polished than what you see now. So even sexier than what it is now. <laughs> uh, and they built this building around it at the Academia de Belle Arte in, in Venice and in Florence. Uh, and they designed this to look like a church, right? A long nave, a transept, and an apse at the end so art with a capital A is in fact dignified, sanctified somehow or another uh, through the setting that it's in. And so we all talk about this statue as if it is, uh, you know, um, what do I want to say, a kind of divine, but people talk about Michelangelo as having divine inspiration. And I want to get away from that kind of thing. And I want to get away from talking about art because there is in Italian at this point, and this is 15.1 to 15.4 when this is carved, there is no word for art. Uh, arte is simply means craft. It also means guild, but it means craft. And it is after Michelangelo makes this that there starts to be a shift in the meaning of that term, and Michelangelo is deeply implicated in it over the course of the 16th century. So what happens if you look at this thing and forget that it's art? then what are you seeing? Are you seeing what uh, contemporary <laughs> culture wants to see? Uh, you know, it's very much a part of the popular culture. So, and that's not bad after all. On the other hand, it gets in the way of our trying to understand what the statue really meant and what it can mean for us. So I wanna look a little bit at that. The statue actually is dated in, in contractual terms with Michelangelo working from 15.1 to 15.4. But the fact of the matter is that the commission goes all the way back to 1408. It had been worked on at least mentally for at least 100 years. Uh, and it was for a statue that was meant to go on the buttress area of the Cathedral of Florence, right there. Uh, and in fact, uh, recently they made a fiberglass cast of the statue and placed it up there very, very briefly. So it is originally a commission for the cathedral. It is meant to be part of the religious art that decorates the facade, the side doors, the um, uh, buttress areas of the building. So why didn't it get put up there? And why did it get taken away? And why do we see it now in this very strange location there is a copy of it in front of the town hall, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, but by what happens to the statue 
when it moves from a place where it was commissioned for to another place which is completely different, to the town hall. So you're moving from a religious center to a political center. The Florentines understood what they were doing. Do we think they simply made a mistake? That they stole it? They liked it because it was art? Well, it wasn't art. So we can't say that, right? So let's look a little bit more if I can make this work. That's one of his boys. Let me just ask you, what are you looking at? Who are you looking at? You're told it was David, right? Is it David? Are you sure it's David? <laughs> Is there anything there that identifies it as David? What is David supposed to have as attributes? Sorry? Slingshot. Slingshot for one thing. Head of Goliath for another. Sword for another. He's supposed to look a little bit like this. This is a statue that was made probably in the middle of the 15th century, meant to decorate the courtyard of the Medici Palace in the city of Florence. <laughs> so 50 years prior to Michelangelo's statue. It's got all the right attributes. There's no doubt who you're looking at, right? Well, excepting how many Davids have you seen that looks as sexy as that? <laughs> Yeah, that's a serious question. So is it a Ganymede figure copied from classical antiquity? Well, yes. Is it a David? Yes, but you still haven't told me who the statue on the left is. Maybe it's David. In fact, in the documentation for the commission, it's called David sometime. <laughs> Most of the time, it's called the giant, Gigante, or Colossus. And in fact, at the beginning of the 16th century, a French uh, cleric touring the city of Florence referred to it simply as a phantasm. He couldn't identify the figure when he saw it. You're having trouble identifying the figure too, right? If you hadn't come in here knowing that you were looking at David, would you have told me right away this is a David? No, of course not. So, I don't know why this doesn't work. There we go, right here. Same figure, right? Only this one is identified. It's got a club and a lion skin, so it's Hercules. So are you really looking at a Hercules figure? Same pose, same stance, same nakedness. By the way, Michelangelo's David had a belt, a girdle of vine leaves, gilt leaves, 15 gilt leaves around its middle when it was first installed. Italy being what it was, they disappeared very quickly. <laughs> All right, so maybe it's David, maybe it's Hercules, but then why would I want to have Hercules? That Hercules is on the campanile of the cathedral. This Hercules is on the side door of the cathedral. So clearly the Florentines have things mixed up, don't they? To put classical imagery like this clearly identifiable on the cathedral. So is Michelangelo making a Hercules? And why would he do that? Thank you, Bill. This is the state seal of the city of Florence. It's a Hercules. So is he thinking of this statue both in terms of its religious context and also in terms of its political context? Let's try the next one. And this is Adam. This is a statue in the Metropolitan Museum, but it was originally for a tomb in the city of Venice. It's by Tullio Lombardo. Uh, and as you can see, the Adam figures, this is from the doors of the baptistry of the city of Florence by Ghiberti, uh, has a girdle of vine leaves around the middle. So maybe ambiguity is part of this statue to start with. Yes, it is David. Yes, it is Hercules. Yes, it is Adam. Depending upon what the needs are and what you want to say in any particular given moment. So the Florentines, and particularly the Medici before Michelangelo, are particularly adept at ambiguity. And in fact, when the Medici did it, uh, they were queried at one point. Cosimo de' Medici was queried 
about what he was really trying to say. And his response to his inquirer was, learn my language. So that's what we're trying to do, right? Learn the language. Now the next. In 1504, over a course of three days, the statue was rolled on logs in a wooden armature from the cathedral down several blocks through the center of the city to the town hall and it was placed to the left of the door of the town hall, which you see here, the Palazzo Vecchio in the city of Florence. So it is moved from a cathedral religious context to this political context. And the next, there is the copy there. All right, so let me just give you a little bit of information. The history of the city of Florence over the course of the 15th and early 16th century is very vexed in terms of who wants to control it. We're watching this develop in our own world now. We had a family, the Medici family, who slowly but surely were taking over control of the city until 1494 when one of the family who was uh, then in control was really not <laughs> terribly adept at politics uh, and he got thrown out and the Florentine Republic was, uh, was replaced. And I should remind you that at the beginning of the 15th century, the Florentine chancellor said, but what is it to be Florentine, but by, Roman, but by law to be Roman and therefore to be free and not a slave. And this whole sense that the, the uh, Medici autocracy had been taken over by now an elected form of government, albeit um, what do I want to say? The elected officials were mostly of the upper classes. Uh, so we have that shift. But in fact, the Medici are thrown out again in 1512. They come back again in 1527. They get thrown out again in 15. So, so there is this shifting back and forth between the Medici and the reclaimed republic. This statue is part of that. When it is put here, it is in fact that sense that the Florentines had of being a republic, Roman and therefore to be free and not a slave. That's one of the reasons it's got this classical uh, vocabulary that it is using. And we've always been so worried about making the Renaissance be a Roman revival that we forgot to look at what was going on in terms of the contemporary world as a reason for the statue to be where it is and what it is. When the statue was put there, this statue was at the left of the door and the Michelangelo David replaced it. This is a statue by Donatello. It also was in the Medici Palace. And when the Medici were thrown out in 1494, a number of things were recuperated from the palace. This being one, the David that I showed you a moment ago, is another. And in 1495, they were taken to the town hall because that's where that imagery belonged. It didn't belong in a private house. This is public imagery. And so when the Republic reclaimed its rights to govern, in fact, they took all of the imagery that was Republican imagery that the Medici were using to clothe themselves with images of power and took it back here. The document is interesting. It says that David replaced the Judith because it is not right for the woman to stand over the man good bit of 16th century misogyny. <laughs> the next please. But when the Medici come back to power uh, after 1512, they commission a number of things. One of the reasons they can come back to power is that one of the Medici family members is elected pope as Leo X. He had been made a cardinal at age 17. The Medici had worked very hard over the course of a century to get one of their family members to control Rome. Okay. Well, the Medici commissioned a number of things when they come back to support their regime. This is the basement painting for one of the rooms in the town hall. That is the border of a tapestry by Raphael at the top. And I don't know whether you can see, but do you see David here? Or not David? And do you see him there? What do you see that's strange about these things? 
David has been decapitated. They're defaming images, right? The Medici don't want David. They know they can't remove the statue because that would cause an uproar in the city and in the art community. But the fact of the matter is, they are using this kind of vocabulary, a visual, a visual vocabulary, to reclaim their place and to say, this statue really doesn't have any meaning. You without a head are not going to operate very well. And, I mean, it, yeah. and if you look in detail, there's more of a defamation. <laughs> if you look here, right in front of the David. So clearly, the statue continues to have meaning. It's not art. It is carrying political propaganda. It is more uh, potent even than our Statue of Liberty. Now the next again. Now interestingly, just about two years, well, just about the time he's given the commission to finish up, when he's finishing up the David, Michelangelo is given the commission to do a battle painting for the main Salone in the town hall in the Palazzo Vecchio that I just showed you a moment ago. So is Leonardo da Vinci. These battle paintings are absolutely standard in town halls in Tuscany. They record important military victories for the city. So he makes this one. Interestingly, all the figures are nude. The paintings are never finished, never completed, because the Medici take, do take control of the city. And all of these commissions that are supposedly honoring the, the new republic are canceled very quickly. Now the next. But I want to remind you, this is a British manuscript from the 14th century showing you a battle. I'm showing you one in color and one in black and white because the black and white was a little clearer. Do you notice that it is a battlefield where there are a lot of naked men? In fact, these are mercenary soldiers and mercenary armies. What do you get if you're a mercenary soldier? Basically, the ruler who's hired you probably is not really going to pay you. So what you get is whatever you can steal from the battlefield. So the victors, in fact, strip the bodies of their enemies that they have killed. So they get the armor, they get the clothing. Nakedness is part of battle. David, remember, was a warrior not just King David. In Younger, it was Saul, the biblical passages, Saul slew his thousands, David his ten thousands. So it is an image of power. And I should say also that Machiavelli wrote in support of the Florentine Republic beginning to have a paid army rather than a mercenary army. And arguing for it, he said, that a paid army is well-formed and not like a mercenary army, male abozzato, badly put together. Those are precisely the two words that were in Michelangelo's contract for the David when he got the commission because it had been partially blocked out by other carvers. So this is a statue that is also connected with shifting notions of armies political activity, military activity, and then the next, for this time. And since all of you were ooing and aahing over that nice naked body that I showed in the first slide, <laughs> let me remind you that we still talk about, use that terminology as the body politic. And if this is the body politic, the solus populus, the health of the people, which was an inscription under the statue of Judith that the David replaced. Then you are looking at a perfected body politic run by the new republic. And the next. And it still means that for the Florentines. This is the statue of David now honoring the Ukrainian people. Thank you very much. Thank you.